Click, talk, and send. Three easy steps to group voice messaging on the web. Today on Call for Help. Welcome to Call for Help. How are you? Good to see you. I'm Leo Laporte. This is the show where we try to make sense of this wacky world of technology that's all around us now in our cars, in our homes, at work, at play, at school, even in church now. I mean, it's everywhere. And if you understand technology, it's not so intimidating. In fact, it's something pretty exciting. It means you can do more things. I mean, we've seen uh, technology change the way people create music, create movies, uh, how they work. They can work at home now. I mean, it, it really is an, an amazing uh, change in everything we know. And so that's what this show is all about, trying to explain it in simple terms. We don't get all futuristic on you. We talk about stuff that is happening right now, right here, uh, so that you can use it. That's the whole idea. This is episode 323. May I introduce my great friend and co-host, Amber MacArthur? Hi, Leo. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. We are going to yak today. Yes, we're going to do some talking. What's uh, yak pack? Yak pack. Um, if you've ever used something like Yahoo Groups where you're communicating with a group of people via text, it's kind of like this, but it's with voice messaging. Oh. Yeah, so it's a, it's kind of a new thing that's popping up. It. Yeah, it's very neat. We tried, remember Slossom, which we yeah. used a while ago to send voice messages by email. Right. It's similar to that, but it's to groups, and uh, it's interesting. Well, we I use Yahoo Groups for my poker buddies. So it, we, a week ahead of the game, there's a, me, a message goes out, and then like a day before, for, but it'd be really cool if I could also send them a voicemail. Yeah, just click a button, and I don't want to get too into it because it's kind of oh, cool. Oh, that'd be so, really neat. Yeah. Oh, maybe we'll set up a uh, because some of these guys don't check their email or their email changes. This would be, you know, hi, this is Leo. Remember, I'm taking your money tonight, <laughs> so bring money. It's we'll not, see it's, ya. it's not for threatening people, but <laughs> if that's what you want to do, that's okay. Mass threats. <laughs> also, Gibson is here. Steve Gibson, our uh, our great security guru, he's going to talk about. We were we, we did a little bit of e-commerce uh, talking last. time. Time he was here. We're going to talk a little more about that, but a very specific part of it uh, that how to identify that you're really on the server you think you're on. This is important because nowadays with phishing scams and so forth, you don't always know that you're you know really on eBay or PayPal or your bank. Uh, my bank's gone to extraordinary lengths. I think almost overdoing it. They have this new thing called Site Key, and they show you a picture that is that is random that only you know. And if you don't see the bagel, mine's yeah. a bagel. If I don't see the bagel, then it's not really the bank. Oh, I have that too. I can barely even get into my own bank account now. It's very hard. And then they <laughs> check the internet address, and, then, and if it's a, if it's one you haven't used before, they said, I don't know. Are you really Leo? Well, then, we. Yeah. They ask you another question. And yeah. It's hard to Yours get is in. doing that, too. And yeah. it's depressing when you get in. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. I'm not sure I really want to see the balance. <laughs> Jen Cutter is also here. She's going to do something. This is pretty cool. I actually a assigned her this. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about these live CD Linux distributions where you can boot Linux from a CD. You don't have to mm -hmm. install it on a hard drive. I mean, that was a really nice thing, right? Because you can try an operating system out. In, in the old days of Windows 98 and 95, you could also boot to a, a, a rest disk, but XP you really can't. So uh, Jen has been assigned uh, making a live Windows CD, a CD that you can boot from that contains Windows on it, and you, and you don't have to install it, and you can run it, and, and this would be very handy for a lot of people. So I think she's succeeded. We'll find out. Very cool. The live CD version of Windows. But before we go any further, I think we need to go to the East Coast. Yes. The Maritimes, baby. Great place to be. We have Peggy on the webcam from Vogler's Cove, Nova Scotia. Is that how you say it, Vogler's Cove? I'm not sure, is but... it Vogler's Cove? Vogler's Hello, Vogler's and Peggy, Vogler's, Vogler's. Yeah. Hi, Leo. Uh, hi, how are you? Welcome to the show. I'm great. It's great to talk with you. Oh, and we see you there. With your robot behind you. What is that behind you? My husband makes robots out of wood, life-size robots. That's actually a small one. They're usually about seven feet tall. Whoa! Yeah. That, that kind of looks like C-3PO a little bit. A little bit. They're all different. He just kind of makes them up as he goes. And uh, Do they move, or is it just a, a sculpture? 
Well, they do. You can pose them, uh -huh. but um, they're just meant to stand there. Peggy, you are a very understanding wife. I, I am. <laughs> Actually, I just did a website for him because I oh. said he's got too many. They've got to start being sold now. What is it? Let me go there. I'd like to see it. Well, I've just started it. It's, oh, it's um, not i-robot or i-bots.com. I dash bots .com. And we understand you just started it, so we're not going to be judgmental. I won't send it to the web <laughs> workshop. I've just got a few pages done. Oh, that is real. Oh, is, uh, I don't. I dash bots dot com. Right. I, like I, I might have typed it wrong. As I bought dash com was taken, so it's just I and then the dash bots b o t s dot com. Hmm, it's not working for me yet, so it might be that it's not up or uh, I'm doing something wrong. Um, hmm. Anyway. Someday that will be online, and that's really yeah. cool. I think that's really a great idea. And so people would buy these, and uh, they could put them up in their home and scare burglars, and <laughs> you could dress well, them up. Does he dress them I up? I guess it's his art. I you think know, it he's is. A, wood, a carpenter by trade, so. It's a sculpture. I think yeah. that that's absolutely cool. I think that's wonderful. It's just there's too many in the house now, so it's like they've how, got to go. How many? <laughs> well, I would say there's about ten. Some of them are <laughs> seven, eight feet tall, and... Sometimes you walk into a room and one will be standing there. It kind of scares you a little bit. So. <laughs> I th like, now, did you go. know when you married your husband that he had this propensity? <laughs> I know. Did you know this ahead no, of time? No, I didn't know then. This is something that's come on later in life? That's right. Uh -huh. Kind of snuck up on me. I think that's great. I think he sounds like a character. He I'd, is. I'd like to meet him. Wow. Well, what can I do for you today? Well, uh... About five years ago, I got my hands on uh, a list of all the programs that may uh, run yeah. when the startup start or when you boot your startup. Right. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Um, and that was... now that list is pretty redundant. A lot of things uh, on my startup list, I, some of them I don't really recognize, right. and it was great having this list right. to tell me you know, what the file was and uh, what it did and whether it was absolutely necessary to have it running. Um, and it's just kind of old now. Yeah, it changes all the time, and yeah. whatever you had five years ago is undoubtedly out of date. Absolutely, and, and sometimes you can, it's easy to tell what some files do, but not all the time. Some of the tags are a little hard to tell. Yeah. Uh, we used to recommend a wonderful site, which has since gone offline. Black, uh, Black Viper did this great site, blackviper.com. Oh. Um, uh, but he was just looking at services. This started because he wanted to strip down Windows to have as few things start up as possible, and because he was a gamer, yeah, and he wanted to, you know, why have all? So he really focused on services. So uh, Major Geeks is now publishing a mirror of this. So I'll put a link in the show notes oh. to this Major Geeks page. That's at least one place you can go. There is also the Elder Geek. So you got MajorGeek.com and then Elder the ElderGeek.com. Okay. He also has a guide to things that start up in Windows. So those are two very good places to look. We'll put those in the show notes because uh, they're really handy. They talk about all the services names. Uh, but now I'm also going to show you a download that I recommend. We've actually recommended this for a long time. It's called Starter. And uh, it's kind of like MS Config. That's probably how you know what's right. in there, right? You play with MS Config. Uh, it's very similar to MS Config, but what it does, which is really neat, is it allows you to get more information on these things. So you oh. can you could click an about box or not about box but a uh, properties box and get more information on the application uh who started it up for instance I've just clicked on Adobe's version qcs2tray.exe which I see starts up and now I know oh this comes from Adobe systems um, ah, here's where it's starting up out of. Oh, that would be great. It's really very useful. It's much more useful than some arbitrary list because you will undoubtedly have things that are unique to your system. Right. right? There's no way a list can include every possible thing. That's right. So uh, I've given you two lists, which are the Elder Geek and Major Geek, but uh, I think this is a really nice program. It's absolutely free. It's called Starter. Starter. And it comes to us from Lion. Uh, at code stuff, uh, so you can uh, if if you just actually just uh, do a search for code stuff and uh, starter, I think you'll find it on Google. Okay. Um, the website, uh, if you, if you if you want to look for it, is codestuff.mirrors with a z dot com, and that you can find a a location for their stuff. Okay. But, but this is a I think a lovely little program that uh, anybody who uses Windows should have it. It's 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 like MS Config on steroids. Oh, hey, <laughs> that sounds it's good to me. what we need, and it tells you a lot more about what's going on. You can turn things off. You can enable them. So give that a try. I think that'll be the most useful thing for you, Peggy. 
I think so. I've got like quite a few computers running, and they're all different. And uh, some things you know, you can kind of follow it and figure out what it is. But there's a few that I just don't know what they are. So now we know what happens when winter comes to Vogler's Cove. Yeah. We got Peggy with her computers. <laughs> we got Peggy's husband with his robots. That's right. Oh, that's so cute. That's right. It kind of keeps him busy. So that's good, but the house is getting full. So I love it, and it's gonna. The website will be i dash bots dot com. Right, we'll like a, i, and then not the underscore, but just the dash. And it's actually up and running now. I just don't have uh, any pictures up yet. I wasn't able to get there. Is it i the letter i or e y e? No, it's the letter i, and then dash, yeah. and then b o t s. Dot com. S as in Sam dot com. I don't know why it's not coming up for me. Oh, that's strange. Um, you might check with your service provider, make sure that they, I will. they've got it running. But I'm sure by the time this show airs, people will be able to see it. Yes. So. And hey, I invite them to buy as many buy, as they buy like. Buy robots here. <laughs> I think they sound like works of art. I mean, the one I can see, even though it's just a webcam, it's imperfect. It looks very, very cool. Well, he really puts a lot of uh, thought and effort, and they're very intricate, and, you know, all the parts move, and everyone is different, and... Uh, if he starts dressing them up, then I would worry. Yeah. Okay, don't, you know, if he goes I'm that, calling the hospital if, they start, if that happens. If they start having clothes and hats... <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work. No. Hey, thanks, Peggy. Have a Thanks great so day. Thanks so much, Leo. I love your show. Oh, well, we're so glad. We love your robots. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, have a good day. How do you know? Isn't that great? I just love it when people have a hobby that's just, you know, unique. I love that. How do you know uh, that the remote web server that you're going to to type in your critical data, your credit card, your bank information really is your bank or Amazon or PayPal? It's a slippery slope. Steve Gibson's here to explain what to look out for. A very important segment. We'll call for help continues right after this. Stay here. Welcome back to Call for Help. Wouldn't it be great if we could reach into our computers and find out who we're truly dealing with on the other end? If only there were some way to verify identity online. Wait a minute, Steve Gibson says there is. And it's not because he's a magician, my friends. He's a security expert with some great ideas on how to verify that the site you're on really is the site you're on. It comes up nowadays with phishing. What really freaks me out is when I'm buying something on some website and using PayPal is an option. I like to use PayPal because the alternative is giving all these individual sites my credit card information. I'd really rather not do that. I mean, you know, caution says give it out as as seldomly as you possibly can. So if, if a site gives me the option of using PayPal, I'll jump at that mm -hmm. because because PayPal knows who I am mm -hmm. and PayPal can send the money to to a third party site, never disclosing any of my 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 financial data. The problem is if you press a button there and they say they're taking you to PayPal, how do you know that's where you really are? I mean, it seems to me, as, you know, being a security conscious, that it'd be very simple for them to instead to send me to a fake. PayPal site that says, hi there, enter in your password. Because the first thing you have to do when you go to PayPal is prove to PayPal that you're who you are. What if you're really giving your PayPal ID, your password, to somebody else? I never even thought of that. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> and, and of course, anytime, you know, people are, are familiar with the idea of, of a, a secure connection with the unbroken key in Netscape right. or a little lock. Right. The question is, how do you know that's the site where you really are? Right. So let me ask you another question. Uh, frequently, we'll, we'll get phishing scams in emails, or we'll just get emails. Maybe they are legitimate with links in the email. Same problem. You click on a link in the email, you don't know if what it says in the email is actually where you're going. Well, and Can you look at the top of the browser and just say, is that right? There's certainly that's what the the internet savvy aware user would do is they would check the URL. The problem is there have been some security exploits in, for example, Internet Explorer and other browsers where it's possible for the URL to be faked. So even so this you, thing at the top of the browser could be wrong. Yes, it'll say and that. Now that's my concern. www.paypal.com, you know, and HTTPS mm -hmm. saying that I'm secure. Am I really on PayPal? So. Um, 
all browsers allow you to look at the security certificate which has been exchanged with the remote server as part of the process of setting up this secure connection. Um, if you right click on if you right click on for example you using Internet Explorer on the, the page and look at the properties you can then click on certificate and see the certificate that the remote server has issued in order to establish your connection. Now you'll notice here, what you want to say is, you'll check issued to www.grc.com. So that should say. And that cannot be spoofed. If that doesn't say what you're expecting it to say, if it doesn't say, for example, paypal.com or whatever, that's your first indication that you've got a problem. That's the point of the certificate, to prove that this is, in fact, coming from that site. Exactly. I, now, there have been exploits in the past that spoof certificates, so, but there's nothing out there right now that'll do that. These well, are secure. There, there, are some, there are some ways that a, an end user can be duped. I just stumbled upon an expired certificate the other day. This is a company called Biosafe that makes little home cholesterol testing kits. And when I went to their site and was going to purchase some, I got this certificate. Now, I get that a lot, unfortunately. There are a lot of sites who haven't kept their certificates up to date. And, and so here it says, we, got a, we have a problem of some sort, and it, it's saying, you know, what's going on? I can look at their certificate, and I can see here that it was issued by Equ Equifax, and it was from 10-13-2004 to 1-13-2006. It just expired. Exactly. We're, we're taping this on the 25th, right. so a couple weeks ago, got it expired. So it's like, okay. And it does verify that address. It does say it was issued to that particular site. So. Well, and in fact, you can look on this other tab, the, cer the certification path. Right. It shows that that certificate was issued by Equifax. Right. And so this is the way these things work, is that a, a website gets a certificate, and it may be either directly signed by the issuer, or sometimes you have what's called a chain of trust where, the, where there'll be an intermediate authority, and it's been trusted. The idea is that that there are because of the, the, the complexity of the way trust works, the idea is that these, these root certificates, as they're called, are pre-installed in your browser. So your browser may have like 40 or 50 absolutely trusted root certificates. That's going to be Equifax, VeriSign, the big companies. Microsoft will thought, have their own Microsoft. thought, exactly. Yeah. And so those are like the, the issuers of the individual site certificates. They may issue themselves a, a, a shorter life one. For example, if you look at the expiration date on these, they're like 2040 right. or something. And those are locked up in a vault. Nobody can get to them. So they, so they don't worry about those getting loose. Right. Then they, they sign their intermediate certificate, which signs the site certificate. And so the idea is, for example, in my case, grc.com, every two years, I have to go through the process of reproving to them. We, we, we exchange email, they have a phone call. Um, I go through some hoops to say to VeriSign, I'm still me, I'm at this business address. I mean, it's not bulletproof. You could fake it. But PayPal, for example, is, is a known site. So what you want to do is before you enter data into a uh, into a page that where it's important to you that this is who you're really talking to, I, and I always do it. Just right click on the page, check the properties, look at the certificate, make sure that it says issued to the site you mean. There, there are ways, as you said, where that could be faked, but that requires that the user ac voluntarily accept a, a, a fraudulent certificate, which. People can do, but if you if you don't make the mistake of of doing so, there's really no way to spoof that. It is it is the best protection you can find. It's using strong encryption, RSA encryption, and it's, it's all the it's good very stuff. Very reliable. Yeah. And any site that says it's secure, any padlocked site, SSL site, the reason it can do that is because it has a certificate from. A from, well, exactly. From someone who Who's your browser tr has has right. has been, Otherwise, been told to trust. No padlock. Right. But verify. You, really, you can get a padlock that's somebody else's, so verify it is the same yes, site. Yes, for example, it could be paypals.com, right. right. and you know, you're know you now entering your data into right. a phishing site. Not good. Check. That's why Steve's the king of security. Uh, he's also the, the, the chief uh, cook and bottle washer at grc.com, the Gibson Research Corporation. A great place to go if you want to know more about security. We do a podcast every week called Security Now. Lots of good stuff. explains a lot of this stuff in greater detail. And, of course, his great program, Spinrite, the ultimate disk maintenance and recovery utility, grc.com. Information about certificates and signing authorities at our show notes, callforhelptv.com. Time for a quick break. 
But before we go, one more chance to take our uh, tech next tech question of the day. It w- actually, this is the first chance, uh, first time we've seen this. <laughs> Which of these is the handle of a famous gamer? Killer, <clears throat> Mad Dog, Fatality, or Super Grandma? I'm a killer. Get to the website, give us the answer, we'll talk about it. When Call for Help continues. Call for help. Time for our Mac tip of the day. Here's how you can publish your iCal calendar online. All you have to do is open up your calendar, click on publish, and then you have the option to publish any of your calendars either to your .Mac account or to a private server. And you can also get access to other information like your alarms and your to-do lists um, and titles and notes. And now we have another caller. We have Gary on the line from Santee, California. Hello, Gary on the line from Santee, California. How are you today? I'm fine, Leo. How about yourself? Very well. Welcome to Call for Help. Well, thank you very much. Uh, My question is concerning uh, determining what the IP configuration is for a Mac computer. Ah, so what exactly do you want to know? You want to know your Internet address? Is that what you want to know? or? That, yes, that, that's exactly what I'm trying to take. Can you take switch me over to the, the Mac there uh, while you're down there? Mike likes to crawl around down below the desk. You don't normally see him, but that's what he's doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you want to know your internet address? Uh, why exactly? I mean, what are you, what are you trying to do with it? Uh, uh, what I'm doing is I understand the IP config for Windows by doing going to the command line and looking yeah. at IP config. Yeah. And I was just wondering what's the, what's the same process for a, for a Macintosh for well, a network? Well, the answer depends on what you're trying to get. If it's just your IP address, that's fairly simple to do. If there's IP config tells you a lot more though. It can tell you what other connections there are to your Mac and that kind of thing. So, what exactly are you trying to find? I guess is what I'm asking. What do you, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying you, to find uh, whether the whether the Mac is actually talking to the uh, the internet or not, or to, to the network. Whether it has a lease, a DHCP lease. Yes. Okay. So that that you would do in the network system preference pane. Actually, you okay. can get a lot of the information you're looking for in the network system preference pane. Uh, we're uh, we're connected via an airport on here, so I'm going to open the airport. But if we're Ethernet, you'd connect, click the Ethernet or whatever. And if you click okay. the TC, so you go to your connection, in other words, and you click the TCP IP tab, you're going to get a lot of the information you'd get from IP config here. For instance, here's my local IP address, uh, the router's address. Um, I even give an IPv6 address, which is completely worthless to me. But the one thing people often use for IP config is release and renew. When you go IP config space release or slash release, yes. so that what that does is that's saying to the DHCP server, the uh, which is either your router or it could be your cable company, whoever's providing you with your internet address. Um, I want a new one, so I'm going to disconnect. I'm going to throw away my current address and ask you to give me a new one. That release and renew is done in one button here on the Macintosh with this button that says Renew DHCP Lease. And okay. uh, essentially what that's going to do is release and renew. It's going to start over. So watch. I'll press it right now. It says, in fact, there's even a, a little tooltip that says press to reacquire an address from the DHCP server. DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And it, it's, it's the way that a server assigns you an Internet address. You know, instead of you putting in an address and hoping that no one else has that address on your, on your local network, the, the server will take an address that it knows is unoccupied and give it to you. In this case, it gave me 192.168.1.197. Let's renew it and see what I get, see if I get a different one. So once I press that button, the first thing that happens is it goes away. Actually, okay. it, didn't, it didn't go away, but it should have gone. I guess it's doing it so fast that it doesn't go away. And I, in fact, do get the same address each time. And that's often the case. The router just takes the next available address, which is often the same. Oh, nope, I got a new one. So this is actually a, a, a phony address. Oh, that's because I have no internet access here. That's why it took so long. So uh, I got an actual dummy address of 160. Oh, now it worked. <laughs> I got a dummy address temporarily of 169. Dot, which is a, a commonly used address when you don't have access. Uh, and then it, then it did reassign, and now I'm 203 instead of 197. So in fact, I got a new. Yeah local IP address. So if that's what you want to do, the release and renew, that's the way you do it. I'll run through it again. You go to the system preference panes, you go to the network preference pane, you open your connection, click the TCP IP tab and press the renew DHCP lease button. Now there are other things you can do with IP config, including 
uh, find out what other things are connected to your system. And you can do that stuff also in the terminal on the Macintosh. Uh, okay. But uh, with, I think, a netstack command. Uh, but if that's something you don't want to know, then don't worry about that. That's the release and renew. Okay, Gary? Okay. Great. I appreciate the help. This oh, I, I, are you a new Mac user? Uh, I, yes, I am. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know Windows. If you know IP config, you're a proficient Windows user. Uh, this is probably, when people switch, the most common thing is people want to know, well, what's the analog for the thing I did on Windows? How, how do I do that on the Mac? Uh, and that's a particularly obscure one. A lot of the other things you can find pretty easily, but that one is an unusual one. I'm glad you asked. So now people who are going to Macs know how to do that. Thanks for okay, the call. Okay, great. Take care, Gary. We appreciate okay, it. thank you very much, Daniel. You're welcome. My pleasure. If you've ever wanted to send a voice message to more than one person at a time, you know that group messaging thing they do uh, in business? Did you know you can do that online? When we come back, we'll show you how to create your very own Yak Pack. Amber MacArthur joins us right after this. Welcome back to Call for Help. We've taken a look at ways uh, to do group text, to do group video chats. Today we're going to do something different, a little voice messaging on the web for groups, and Amber's going to show us how it works. The so last time I got, they, they do this in business a lot, where the president will come online of the company and say, I have an announcement to make to all of our associates. In fact, the last time I got one was when I was at Ziff Davis, and they announced, we're going to do a tech network. I remember that very well. Erica Poe, the CEO. And that was the beginning of ZDTV. Yeah, that was in 1997. That's how long it's been since I got one of those. They do that here really as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do it internally here yeah. as well. So you got, everybody gets the same voicemail. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this is a little bit different. It's called Yak Pack. And what it allows you to do is create groups online and send voicemails to individuals in your group as well as to the entire group. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons I found out about it was because someone, his name is Coach Fu. Uh, he does, <laughs> I'm meeting new friends on the internet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he does a podcast. Podcast and in order to get any feedback from his listeners, what he's done is he set up this group where they can all can leave voice messages for him, so he can actually get. Oh, so it's incoming audio. as well as outgoing. Exactly, you get you have to sign up for an account, but it's completely free. So um, it's a do neat way to do Do they put ads things. on the voicemail? Yes, they put ads in the voicemail. So, oh, sorry, not on the voicemail. They put ads in the site itself. But not in the not in the voicemail. Oh, that's great. Um, and if you pay ten dollars, you can get a, get an account with them, and there are no ads on it at all. I'm so, gonna do this for my poker buddy. Yeah, it's not yeah. too bad. Okay, so we'll take a look at. It. It's yakpack.com. Um, it's all on the web, as you can see here. This is what it would look like if you had, you know, a bunch of people in your yakpack group. Mm -hmm. I don't have that many people yet, um, but it's a bunch of different icons. So it's all the people in the one group. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take a look at my group here. So I've created a group called Call for Help, um, and in it I just have so far Sean right here, and I have Mike right here, and uh, I have myself here in the center. Um, and you can move all these people around. So if you want to add a bunch of people, it's pretty easy to do that as well. Um, um, and then if I want to record a message for, let's say, um, Mike, I can click on Mike, um, click there, and then all I have to do is go up to the top right and click on Record, and then it will connect, and then we have to allow it to um, access our computer, click OK, and then I can say, hey, Mike, how are you doing? Hopefully you're having a great day, and thanks for showing us that poster with, uh, I think it was Jobs and and uh, oh, yeah. gates. gates and jobs. Yes. Enemy, of the, enemy of the gates. Enemy of the gates. So then I click stop, and then I can send it. So it makes wow. nice sounds too. <laughs> now, is this going to is this going to his email? No, his phone. This no, this is going to um, his Yak Pack account. So he has okay. his own account. So when he logs in, he can check to Got see it. if he has voice. So he has to check his account. Exactly. Okay. So then what what would happen? For example, we'll see here. It looks like Sean has possibly sent me a message. So we'll click on that. See what it says. Um, this is kind of neat. I know. Okay. Oh, and then that? I can say, let's that's try it again. That's what you just did, yeah. Yeah, we'll try that again. Hi, Amber. This, okay. this looks really, really cool. We should really do a segment on this right now. The quality is very good. I guess it would be good because <laughs> you're actually recording wave files and sending them. Yeah, so you can, you can hear yourself in the background. You're saying, what is it? So yeah. um, this is something we just did on the fly. So it's very, very easy to use. Um, I've also uh, looked into it a little more, and there's some musicians who are in bands who are using this to exchange uh, audio files as well. So they're playing you know, tunes, and then they're exchanging and say, hey, listen to this on the fly. So is that's there a limit neat. on the length? Um, I couldn't find any words about uh, or any information about limits on the length right now. It, it's, it's in beta, and I also wanted to warn people about that because it can be a little bit flaky on and off. Um, 
Um, and also, they haven't set it up so well that if I were to send a message to you and ask you to um, listen to a voicemail, there, it's not that easy for you to sign up. You kind of have to go back to square one to the site and do that whole process again. So you want everybody to have an account yeah, first. Yeah, everyone has to have an account first. But, you know, eventually when they work out some of those kinks, it will be a lot better. Um, but there is a musician who um, has written about using it. That seems really neat that he's able to share music with his band um, and then just go online. If I want to as well, another feature that it has is that if I have a bunch of people in my group, let's say you know you had everybody from the Call for Help team, maybe 20 people, um, you can go down here and you can click Select All, um, and then you can send a message to all of them in the entire group, so you don't have to just send it to one person. So it's an easy, really easy way for you to say record and say, "Hey, I'm running late this morning. Um, you know, I got tied up or something like that." So a quick thing to do that as well. Uh, the last thing I want to show is that uh, there's another feature which is really common, I think, in a lot of these services that sort of like Web 2.0 services is that you can take um, something like Yak Pack and you can put it on your website or on your blog so people have easy access that's to it. That's what we need. Yes, yeah, so that's where yeah. it becomes really handy is that when you go to your website and then all of a sudden you know for Call for Help if we have on our internal wiki or something right. like that um, you have a place that. Yeah, you have a place that says check Yak Pack and there's there are voice messages for everybody. Well, it, so it'll blink for you or it'll say there's something. Yeah, there's there'll be information there. there and so it's really easy. All you do is go into um, you go into Yak Pack again and you set it up. You know, this happens on a lot of these sites where you just cut you know and paste. cut and paste the yeah. code um, and what I've done is I've just set it up on just this sort of fake blog that I set up. And you can see down at the bottom, I have my little Yak Pack um, icon. So I click on that. Um, and then the ent my t entire Yak Pack group will open up in a new window. And then I can start yak yakking from there. Now, if somebody clicks on that and they're not a member, they do have to sign up for they Yak Pack? They do have to sign up. And Sean and I went back and forth a little bit because he helped me set up for this segment. And uh, it's it's not, that part is a little bit That's too bad because, for tricky. instance, I could put it on the Twit site and say, you know, send us a voicemail. They click a button. But if they have to sign up, that's kind of a dis it, disincentive to yes, do that. Yes. And what um, Coach Fu has done, because he recognizes that that's a problem, is he's below where his little Yak Pack logo is on his site. He he's a put a username and password. That's just the name of his podcast and a password. So every Everybody immediately, is, when they click it, ah. can automatically log in and leave feedback. And so he's using it as you know, a way to chat and not forcing people to go through kind of that cumbersome um, login process, which requires a bunch of other information. So I, that's a way I'm you can get around this. it. That might be a great way for us to take questions on the podcast. I like that would that. be really cool. And then yeah. you could you know, play them right away, and you know, the audio is decent. And Let's put that in the new design. Yes. One more thing. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'll, get, I'll get right on that after the show. Like this, you, know. know. you can certainly go crazy with these things. Well, but you that's can. Just, uh, there are a lot of people who would like to do it audio, and for a podcast, for instance, you want it audio. It makes sense to get feedback, and I mean, there's other people who are using this as well. There was a there's a little profile of a kid who use, who's using it to leave her grandmother messages, Aww. and just an easier way to be able to communicate online. Oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Yeah, I like, that. I, I like all these audio things on the web. You're seeing a lot more audio, a lot yeah. more video, so it's rich not just media. I know rich media. Yeah. It's a big chunky buttons and things you just click on and talk instead of sitting there and typing. Right, right. Let's get away from the keyboard. That's yeah, so we 19th don't need, century. Yeah, we don't. Need it. For more about chatting, visit Yak Pack uh, or go to callforhelptv.com. We can fill you in on all of it with Amber's show notes. And if you have some more suggestions for Amber, we'd love yep. to hear them. You can email me at amber at callforhelptv.com. Now, more of your calls are on the way. But first, I hear the gang in the control room at hard at work crafting and constructing a special sculpture, a little robot for us, perhaps. Let's take a look. Ten, nine, <laughs> wow. Six, now, that's, that's good. That's really good. You guys just did that in the break? No. Welcome back to Call for Help. Time for our Skype tip of the day. Here's how you call someone on Skype. All you have to do is make sure the person's online, and we have Mikey here who is online. Click on the name, and then down at the bottom of the screen, we have this big green button. So we click on that, call Mike, and uh, he may or may not answer, but at least the call is going through. And now we have another caller. We have Joe on the webcam from Tampa Bay, Florida. And we'll, just, we'll hang up on Mikey. <laughs> he hung up Hello, on Mikey. guys. Hello, <laughs> Hi there. Joe. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Well, I'm just great. How are things? Well, look, he's got, like, is that an IBM System 370 behind you? I'm uh, afraid not. Those are uh, HP DL360s. Oh, man. What are you? Are you in a computer lab? Where are you? Yeah, I'm in our uh, network room here, oh. my company. Uh, are you the uh, network administrator? Yes, I am. Wow. Well, I'm technically the systems administrator. Look actually. at that. This is. And what operating system are those HPs running? Is that HP UX or? Uh, those are actually going to be uh, Server 2003. Wow. All Windows. 
Yeah, we're pretty much a Windows shop except for some back-end uh, equipment. That's cool. Well, what can I do for you, Joe? It seems like I should be asking you for help, not the other way around. <laughs> well, I'm actually just calling to see if I could get some suggestions from you guys uh, for some server performance or uh, testing, like uh, load testing and uh, yeah. that sort of thing to do servers, whether it be freeware or paid software, whatever you guys could recommend. Actually, Microsoft has enough. Something that might be helpful for capacity planning and things yeah. like that. Yeah, Mike, I, you know, it's funny that you should ask this because I've been having a lot of trouble on my website managing the peaks of traffic that we've been getting, and I've been looking for web stress tools to to test it and see, you know, uh, uh, to see what I can handle and, and maybe tune my applications for that, which is what I'm doing on a small scale, you're doing on a much larger scale. And I found that Microsoft actually makes a number of these kinds of tools. This is the web application stress tool from Microsoft. These are absolutely free. And it's designed, it says, to realistically simulate multiple browsers requesting pages from a website. And when they say multiple, they mean multiple, lots of them. You can really bang on it. Now, this is for IIS. They also have one for Exchange Server. So, depending on what kind of servers you want to test, is it is it a web server or a mail server you want to test? Uh, mostly mail servers and yeah. file servers and things of that nature. Yeah, I don't know about file servers, but I bet. I mean, I know they have one for Exchange, and they know they have one for web. Uh, I would bet that if they have them for those, they might also have a file server test. Uh, system. And of course, you could always, I guess, uh, make the web application stress tool hit your file server by having it like click on a link that goes to the file server each time. This sure. is completely customizable, so you can say, "Here's what I want you to do." It's almost a little, a little robot, uh, and then uh, each machine can do a certain number of sessions uh, per machine, and then you might want to distribute it over a number of machines to right. really get a, a, a real test. But this is, yeah, Microsoft does a very good idea, a very good job of this. They have a number of support tools for stress testing and performance analysis. Uh, and since you're running uh, Server 2003, this is going to be great. I mean, here's one for SQL Server. Um, uh, I would say this is the place to go. I'll put links in the show notes to all of this. But if you just go to uh, Microsoft.com and search for stress test, uh, you're going to find they have three or four really good tools. There are open source Unix-type tools uh, there's one that is written in Python that allows you to kind of create a test suite in Python and then bang on a server. But since you're a Windows shop, I, th I, would I think the Microsoft tools are what you really want to use. Yeah, I like the sound of that because a lot of the free ones that I've found don't really do actual testing on the server. They just run a couple connections from a client. They don't right. physically generate a load on the server. Right. Well, these will, it's, these will by actually, it, it looks like real life traffic, which is what you want. You don't want anything right. artificial. You want Absolutely. it to look like thousands of people are hitting your server at the same time. Sure. So I'll give these a shot, Joe. I think they're going to be great for your brand new HP array back there. That looks pretty yeah. good. How much great. storage do you have on your server? Uh, these are just the one U um, 72 gig uh, drive assembly. that will be just uh, mirror drives. Okay. How many of them are you got in there? Well, these are two. I'm, I'm actually doing a large project for our company, deploying these around the globe in 26 offices. Wow, so. that's cool. Is it a secret? Uh, what, pretty neat. Is it a secret what your company is, or can you tell us what you're doing? Oh, I can tell you. It's a company called Transammonia. We do uh, global trading of commodities and chemicals oh, and things like that. Oh, so that's why it's so important, man. What you cannot oh, yeah. let these servers go down. Now uh, we have to make sure these stay up all the time yeah. and get good performance in real time. Because if you're doing trades, every second counts. Right. Wow. Well, good luck, Joe. It sounds like you have a high-stress job. I hope you have a chance to go fishing and, and go down to the beach and stuff. Uh, Tampa, I know they have some great deep-sea fishing and things like yeah, that. Yeah, it does. I can't wait to get a vacation. Good. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Joe. Have a great one. Right. Appreciate lot, you man. watching Call for Help. We have some amazing viewers all over the world. Hey, you know, I've often uh, uh, hung out with my friends, a group of friends, and we're listening to fantastic songs on the radio, you know, just rocking out with the transistor. But none of us can remember who's singing that song. Today, Amber's going to show you a little application that will help you turn your uh, your mystery songs into tunes you can buy and know about. Yes. Is that the idea? That's the idea. Um, the program is called Tunatic, and it was sent to us from Janelle, who's from Australia. Thank you, Janelle. Yes, thank you very much. And what it does is it's a tiny little player. It's completely free. So if you're listening to a song on a radio, on the radio, and you have a microphone, and you can put the mic up to the, song, <laughs> to the radio, it will tell you 
what the song is. Some it, uh, cell phones do this. Yes. But this is something on your computer. This is something on your computer. Um, so you can also do it when you're playing a song in iTunes or another media player where okay. you're playing the song and we'll analyze what song you're playing. Um, now, the only thing I will say is that it's been a little tricky trying to get it to work in here today, but I have tested it out and it works pretty well. Is it fairly well. accurate? Um, it is fairly accurate. It's just the problem is that we can't talk at all while we're playing the song right. or else it will throw off uh, the uh, analyzer. Right. So Wanna we'll try show you. It? Yeah, let's try it and we'll show you how it works. So here, all Everybody we have to do. Very, very, very quiet. Quiet. Okay, so here we go. Um, here it, I have iTunes open, and I'm going to play this song right here. Um, play, and then for about 10 seconds, we won't be able to talk. Okay, shh. It's never going to guess this. I'm sorry. Yeah, it got it. Oh, my yes. God. I can't believe that. It's the most... Where'd you get that song? It's completely obscure. I know. It was a free song on iTunes. You know they have those free downloads. I, I am stunned that it actually knew the song based on that. Well, I'm so glad So it it's matching a, a fingerprint. Unbelievable. I know. Unbelievable. Isn't that cool? Wow. Yeah, What's it's called really, again? It's called Tunatic. It's for uh, Mac and Windows. It's completely free. Tunatic. So, tun yeah, Tunatic. It's all one word, yeah, but yeah. Uh, Tunatic would well, actually be a better Jim name. Well, thank you, What a yes. great uh, Tunatic. Tunatic, Or yes. Tunatic, oh. depending on your syllable. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Another great free file. Wow. Keep sending them to us. Yeah, at Amber at, at callforhelptv.com. Because we, uh, I mean, sometimes our audience comes up with better stuff than we could possibly Oh, find. they really do. That's wonderful. Sometimes, all the time. <laughs> is your computer the source of many sleepless nights? Perhaps your computer has recently bit the El Dusto Rono. That's the uh, next song on this list. And you haven't the faintest idea where to begin to fix it. Jen Cutter's here to talk about how you can get going again. A, a, a really remarkable thing, a live CD version of Windows. But before we do that, one last shot of the next tech quiz question of the day. Which of these is the handle of a very famous gamer? Was it Killer, Mad Dog, Fatality, or Super Grandma? Come and get me, sonny! I got the BMG 9000! We'll be right back with the answer right after this. Back to call for help. Before the break, we asked you which of these is a famous gamer. I'm thinking fatality, but I, I really don't know. Noah came up with this question. Noah, what's the answer? The answer is fatality. What a good guesser I am. Spelled with a one, by the way, because he's leaked. And I know Super Grandma, and she's good too. So uh, these days, we invest so much time and money in our computers, and, and, and we really need a, a way to kind of get them up and running if something goes wrong. Now, Windows 98, you can just boot the uh, rescue disk. There ain't no rescue disk for Windows XP. Well, maybe yeah. there is. Jen Cutter is here today to talk about a live Windows CD. It's called BART PE. Yep. I gave you this assignment. And you did it. I Well, thankfully, I didn't have a lot to do. <laughs> Standing Bart did all the work for me. He's done me. all the work. Yeah. Now, you can buy, I didn't know this, you just told me, you can mm -hmm. buy a live CD of Windows. You can. You have to go through Microsoft, and it's usually like a developer's tool. So you have to prove that you need this. You can't just buy it all willy-nilly. And how much is it? It's about 300 U.S. Oh, okay. So it's very pricey. This is the free alternative. Right. Now, wait, we've recommended in the past uh, Linux-based mm -hmm. boot disks, like the Enhanced Boot CD, EBCD from PC Ministry. That's yeah. very good. Nopix-based. Nopix, Ubuntu, they're yeah. all good. So those can be used for rescue disks as well. But mm -hmm. this is Windows. If you this want Windows. Windows. If you want Windows, you want to keep it... Like, but you don't get the full files. GUI. No, you don't. It's very, very stripped down. This is kind of the last stop for, for you to collect your files before you reformat and start again. So that's where you would use this. If your yeah. system can't boot Windows otherwise, you mm -hmm. could, but you still could get to the hard drive. You can. It, like, if you wanted to, you can use this to rescue it. You can go in, edit the registry. Right. You can actually run like the great check disk and scan disk because Windows files aren't actually being run. Right. So we can get full access to the system. Right. Uh, so this might be a good one for uh, doing a scan disk or a check disk yeah. or a defrag. Uh, if you can't do it while you're running Windows, just mm -hmm. reboot into this and do it. Yeah, there's plugins you can get. Like you can run hijack this from the Bard PE. Oh, that's So this nice. way, all the Windows then files. Then you'll really open. know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it hard to make? I mean, no. It's it's actually nice and simple. Uh, Bard did a great job putting it together. What do you need? You need you need your Windows XP installation CD. Okay. Now, if you have like an older XP installation that only has Service Pack One, you're going to have to slipstream Service if you Pack want Two into XP2 it. Two in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, show us what we can do. Um. 
Let's see. Not much. Not too much. Yeah, it's <laughs> very simple. You got a simple. command prompt. You got a good. command prompt. You have some access to some of the Calculator. basic uh, Windows <laughs> files, and one of the other Can alternate you play uses for this. No, no solitaire. <laughs> no Minesweeper either. The standards are gone. But you can set this up and lock it down so that if someone wants to use "quote unquote" Windows right. and you don't want them touching your hard drive, you just put in a live CD like for this or Linux, right. and they can access the internet. They can do this. Uh, can but it's got Drive this. Snapshot. It's got Drive ways snapshot? to make yeah. copies of the drive. You can test the thing, a remote desktop to it. So yeah. there actually is enough functionality in there to, to do what it's supposed to do, which would be a rescue disk. Yes, right? exactly. Bart PE is it free? It's totally free. And thanks to Bart. For making that. That's right. Yeah, we cool. got all the links in the show notes to get you started. Next version of Open Alpha just came out, yeah. right? Is that episode four or five? Uh, we're at uh, seven. Seven. <laughs> oh, I've missed a few. I'm going to have to uh, download them. OpenAlpha.tv. This mm -hmm. current episode is about World of Warcraft. You're going to get me hooked again, aren't you? Pretty much. You're bad. That's terrible. Ruining lives. And, uh, and if you want to check out her podcast, do check it out at openalpha.tv and read about everything we talked about here with Bart P.E. on our site, callforhelptv.com. A final word coming up right after this. Stay right here. Welcome back to Call for Help. How are you today? See, we have robots, too. I guess our, uh, our technical director, Ken Gamble's dad, was famous. John Gamble was famous for making tin robots. He was a metal So worker. cool. Isn't that neat? Yeah, he has little uh, sardine cans for his feet. So who knew that this is like a big hobby? Uh, maybe not. Maybe it was just him and uh, and uh, the guy in uh, Vogel's Cove. But uh, <laughs> Peggy's husband. I don't know. <laughs> but we've got one anyway. It's the cold Canadian winters. Yes. There's nothing else to do. It is. It's a we, Canadian we thing. We build robots. <laughs> I'm going to start any day now. <laughs> hey, I wanted to mention that BART PE uh, boot disk. We have the information on making that online, thanks to Jen Cutter. And it is a good idea to make a rescue disk, whether it's that or EBCD now while Windows is working. Because by the time Windows isn't working, it's too late. So everybody should have a rescue disk in their repertoire, and uh, I think probably both is a good idea. We're going to order the Microsoft disk, see what it does that uh, BART PE doesn't do. I, don't, I can't imagine it would boot the whole GUI and have solitaire in it and everything. I think it probably is just a rescue disk like that. Is this Ken? Does this guy have a name? We should name him. The Gambler? The Gambler. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. <laughs> Remember, if you have a problem with your personal confuser, don't whine. Don't moan. Hey, she sounds like a robot, too. Well, uh, we would have to start that one over. <laughs> we did not rehearse that, just so everybody knows. I didn't know the robot was going to be here. You have to talk like this if you're going to be a robot. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, no, I broke it. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't no, care. It's fine. okay. He's all right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> all right. Put it back That's fun. His father apparently had a bunch of these hanging from the ceiling in the uh, basement. So cool! Yeah, as he as he was a kid growing I, I'll up. I'll hold on to him. Uh, if you do if you do robots, maybe this is a whole subculture. Send us a picture. We could have a collection of robots people make. That be that be kind of cool. Why? Well, thanks, Steve Gibson, for stopping by with his security advice. He joins us almost every week on Call for Up. Jen Cutter for her hacks. She'll be back. We've got lots more hacking for her to do. Uh, of course, the guys behind the scenes who make it possible: Sean Carruthers and. Uh, Mike Lazazara and, and, and you, Amber MacArthur. I'm Leo Laporte. Remember, if you've got a problem with your personal confuser, don't whine, don't moan, don't yell. Just call, call for help. We'll see you later. Come back soon. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.